Why are Palestinian lives not valued in the same way? So, why is Gaza exceptional? Nadia Nakla is a Scottish Palestinian counsellor for Dundee and a psychotherapist. She's also married to Scotland's First Minister, Hamza Youssef. For weeks, both of her parents were stuck in Gaza as the besieged enclave endured Israeli bombardment that has killed at least 10,000 people. It's, it's terrifying. You know, so if they don't get killed by a bomb or a sniper or a tank fire, then they, they'll starve. This followed the 7th of October Hamas-led attack on Israel, which killed at least 1,400 people. In this Real Talk episode, we sat down with Nadia in Edinburgh to speak about the distressing experiences of her parents and other relatives in Gaza and why she's calling for an immediate ceasefire. We filmed this interview a day before Nadia's parents were allowed to leave Gaza through the Rafah crossing and eventually were reunited in Scotland. This is how our conversation went. Now, if we just look at this from, from I guess, a more general mm -hmm. sense, I mean, your parents, your father's Palestinian. Yes. Um, your mother's Scottish and they were basically in Gaza visiting your brother, they were visiting relatives. My grandmother has been your grandmother. ill for a long time. Okay. Um, so it was actually a trip that I was planning to take with them as well, which I... You were supposed to be I was them. supposed to go, yeah. I mean, how um, does that feel? Even just the idea that you were that, you were that yeah. close to being there as well? Like, people ask us, why would they go there? It's a war-torn place and it was, our advice is not to, to go, but would you not visit your dying mother? Sure. Would I not want to see my grandmother for the last time? Um, and also, we saw the situation as improving because we hadn't been able to visit Gaza for, for over 10 years um, because it's under siege. So actually, Egypt had allowed this service called a VIP service to, you could travel into Gaza. So this was huge. This meant we could see our family again. Right. Um, and so I was very keen to go. Unfortunately, diaries didn't match up. And my parents, there was a deal actually <laughs> at Rafa. If you traveled before the beginning of October, you, got, you, you saved about a thousand pounds. So they decided to travel early. And if they, uh, you know, they'd waited to mid-October, they would have not been in the situation they are, but it's, it's their fate. And how are you taking all this in? I mean, I can only imagine what you're going through, but if you're willing to share just a, a little bit. Yeah, I feel like words are starting to escape me for the horror that we are seeing. Um, it's so heartbreaking and tragic, but also can be stopped. And we're, what we're seeing is the death of thousands and thousands of children. We're literally just watching them on the TV and there's no help getting in. I've never felt more helpless and lack of hope and lack of belief in humanity than I do right now. Um, lack and belief in humanity. Where are all the, the Arab leaders, the Western leaders, the world leaders who have an obligation to uphold international law? And Israel has an obligation to uphold international law. And what we see is actually Israel being enabled. You know, America said there's no red line when it comes to Israel. Yeah. So what we're seeing now is carpet bombing, where we know in the most densely populated areas with civilians. So I don't believe that civilian life has been protected in any way. And the world we are watching and those with power, I feel are talking a lot, but with very little action. Yeah. I mean, how have you been communicating with your parents? I mean, we've seen, mm -hmm. I think one, one or two videos mm -hmm. um, of your mother that, that, that were, they were posted online and basically yeah. it was an emotional plea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll take some, thank you so much. <laughs> um, and it was an emotional plea by your mother yeah. and obviously the, the videos were shared on social media mm -hmm. quite largely. Uh, again, I, I, what is that like, getting these videos, talking to them? I don't know how much you have been able to talk to them because the, you know, the power has been cut and mm -hmm. sometimes it comes back the internet sometimes it doesn't but mostly it's you know as far as we know the communication has been down for for the last few days yes. um but it's been back up for maybe a few hours i, yeah. I don't know i mean what what has that been like for you yeah communication is very difficult um internet has been cut in, in our area um and obviously with the complete blackout for two days it's i am very much becoming um putting up a wall so when i hear my mother cry I'm trying not to feel it in those moments because I have to create some kind of hope for her that she will get home and she will be safe. And then on the other side of that, she's saying to me, okay, I might be safe, but what about the two million people that are here? What about your brother? What yeah. about you know her granddaughter and her, her grandsons? And for that, I almost feel like I'm compartmentalizing like the safety of my parents. They actually have an option and they have yeah. hope to get out. 
my brother does not. So for yeah. me, it's like I will deal with that once the media of I get my parents out and then how do I help my brother if I can? This is something that you actually spoke about, you know, that, that your parents may have to face an impossible decision soon mm -hmm. if they are able to get the opportunity to leave through Rafa. Yeah. But then, like you say, your brother and his family who don't have UK passports would have to stay. Yeah. And is that something that you were already discussing, or are you just kind of avoiding that, or you, you don't you get you'll get to it when you get to it, or look if my parents staying in Gaza protected my family, I would tell them to stay, and they would stay in a heartbeat. Really? But there's no protection of anyone. Yeah. No one in Gaza is safe. Yeah. Them being there just adds to the death toll, yeah. and the casualties, and yeah. the, the the strain on resources. We have a hundred people in our house, no electricity, no water, no food. The more people that are there, the low, the smaller the resources are for everyone. So it, it's almost like for all of us, and my brother was the first to say they need to leave and they need to leave now. Um, so yeah, if we had an option and you know we could try this or try that, there's no option. If you can leave Gaza and get to safety, then you should be able to do that. And you know what we've seen for the past 25 days is ultimately 2.2 million people herded into a tiny piece of land, unable to leave while being carpet bombed. Yeah. We're seeing tank fire now. Like it's, it's, it's unimaginable. Yeah. You know, we had a, a tiny bit of that in COVID. You yeah. could go out for one walk and everyone found that very difficult, the restriction on freedom of movement. But people couldn't deal with lockdowns, right? They couldn't deal with we lockdowns. We struggled in lockdown yeah. mentally, physically, you know, socially, like our family connections. That while being under a danger to your life and your whole family's life, for me is unimaginable that I have nowhere to run. I have nowhere to go. It's heartbreaking if we dwell on it. And I think for me, I'm not dwelling on the situation because it's if I dwell on it, all my hope is gone. Yeah. It's a hopeless situation right now. Yeah. And the only thing that can help is a ceasefire. Yeah. And we're not hearing that or seeing that yeah. enough. Yeah. In terms of, I guess, the day-to-day -day survival of your parents and your family, mm -hmm. uh, what are they doing? My mum said the kids help her pass the time. So during the day, the children are less scared. My mum is less scared. She says they play, they dance, they twirl. Um, they call her granny, which is really cute. Um, and the, the first thing one of the, the four-year-old said to her that's a distant relative of mine was, um, do you speak English? My mum said, yeah. And she says, I love you. <laughs> so, you know, children bring such joy sure. and hope. Um, but the night is terrifying. Of course. They all scream and they cry. The bombing. Right? And it's complete darkness complete darkness. Um, you can use the light from their phone, but their batteries are dying, so they're turning their phones off. So, you know, it gets dark around five-ish. You know, the night is long, and that's the most difficult, I think, psychologically to cope with mm. for my family. Mm. Well, I don't want to keep you up for long. Let's, let's have a seat. We're yeah, just getting some drinks here. <laughs> I want you to kind of bring me here and how everything has been affecting you here and your family here. Mm -hmm. How have you been kind of receiving all of this? Mm -hmm. It's been very difficult because I think I like, I've always been an activist my yeah. whole life. So for me, it's like, there's a problem. How do we fix it? How do we bring attention to it? How do we, how do we do meaningful, impactful work? That's how I've always been driven. And this is probably one of the most times that I've felt helpless. Like I can't find the words to communicate how devastated I am. Um, not just for the safety of my family, but for the fact that I feel that Gaza could be gone forever. And I'm trying actually just to not let my mind go to that place. Mm. You've said that, again, just speaking about your family for this moment, you've basically said that you were not only concerned about your parents or your brother, but your, your concern for the children, your nephews, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of impact is that having on the kids? What's going on right now? Well, Amir is 10 weeks old and he needs baby milk. 10 weeks old? 10 weeks old. Wow. Um, he needs that's, baby that's milk. That's your brother's fourth child. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're drinking dirty water. They're drinking salt water the diseases that will come from that, the impact on him as a baby is, is just, it's, it's terrifying. You know, so if they don't get killed by a bomb or a sniper or a tank fire, then they'll starve 
or will they get sick from diarrhea and, and, and die from that? You know, things that are all preventable. Your husband, Hamza Youssef, the first minister of Scotland, he's been making the media rounds. You've been making the media rounds. Um, it, in my personal opinion, I think maybe the media coverage hasn't been strong enough for a couple in your position. Mm -hmm. I feel like the media coverage would have been a lot more, uh, would, just would have been larger, let's say, um, if it were somebody else, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree with this or not, mm -hmm. in terms of how the coverage of somebody's family, uh, again, a couple in your position having their family involved mm -hmm. in Gaza. I think what struck us most is actually the position that my husband is in, that we're in, and we're still struggling to, to help in our families in, in any way. So for families that don't have the public profile that, that we have, then I, if it would feel even more desperate. Um, and I think the media coverage that I feel the strongest about is I'm so fed up of men in suits talking. You're men all, in suits. You're just talking all the time. You know, the emergency summit and another emergency summit with no action. So that upsets me more than, than any kind of like my story not being on a, a higher uh, platform or spoken about enough. It's like, how many times do we have to hear people give speeches about the thousands and thousands of children that are being murdered in Gaza, but yet there's no action and we're just continuing to see the same image. Refugee camps bombed, journalists killed, ambulances bombed. This is really, really traumatic to watch. Why are Palestinian lives not valued in the same way? Mm. So why is Gaza exceptional? Why do international laws, can Geneva, can Geneva conventions, those apply like every other country that is at war. Gaza is exceptional for one reason, that Israel is exceptional in the treatment and the actual carte blanche that they've been given by the UK and the US. So when I see things like that, it devastates me on a level of such upset with the world that how can you actually America be sending bombs at the same time as sending aid while bombing refugee camps that we have to watch on our TV screens and justify it by saying, oh, well, one, two, three, four, however many Hamas were killed, those children that we saw playing just moments before, they will stay with me forever. That's like my child. It's like anyone's child. To the humanity, to not care. Israel knows who they're targeting. They know where the civilians are and they still choose chose, sorry, to do that. They chose to hit a refugee camp, twice. You've spoken before about visiting Gaza as yeah. a child. Mm -hmm. Was it every summer? You'd visit every yeah. summer for a period. Can you talk to me about these memories that you have of Gaza? Yeah, oh, I used to love Gaza. So my family are very loud and we love to sing and dance. And my dad had been uh, married before and there was, it was eight of us together mm. um, when we, Four used to live in Gaza and four of us lived in Scotland and when we came together in summer all together and we used to just dance and sing. Um, the best times were at the beach, we'd just spend like the whole day there. The beach in Gaza is absolutely beautiful. Um, your shawarma wraps, your falafel wraps, it was just, it was just, it felt like another home to me. Yeah. Um, and I remember my profile picture used to say I left my heart in Gaza and that's how I felt. Like I just, a part of me was always there and you know I'm proud to be a Scottish Palestinian but when you have kind of two identities, yeah. um, you get to pick kind of the best of both. You know, you love the Arabic dancing, I love the Scottish food or, you know, vice versa. And it's, you get to enjoy these amazingly different cultures. Um, and I just, I just loved being there. I loved yeah. the people, I loved the food, I loved the noise. I just loved it. And your, your fear now is, is for all of that to be gone, is basically mm -hmm. what you're saying. Yeah. For, for, for for these memories, not for the memories to disappear, but the places that these memories were made in to disappear. I think it goes even deeper than that. My aunt said to me the other day, like she has no homeland. So she was a refugee in Libya. She married my uncle, moved to Scotland. And she then, they worked in Saudi Arabia for 16 years. And now she's back in Scotland. And although she loves Scotland, it doesn't feel like her home. Palestine is her home and she can't live there. She can't be there. She can't raise her children there. So to feel like you have no homeland, I actually can't relate to that. 
because I've just told you I feel like I've got two homes. But to feel like you have nowhere that is yours is difficult. And also as well, like even for our family, like how do you all visit each other? You know, we're all over the world. That's a Palestinian family problem. Yeah. I have family, siblings, just in Scotland, Canada, Libya, the West Bank, Gaza. You know, where did we all meet? How do you all meet you can. in one place? We can't. And that's, again, the heartbreak. My sister hasn't seen her mother in 10 years. And they had the conversation on the phone. My, my, my stepmom said, I thought we would get to meet again, but I think I was wrong. And that broke my sister. But Gaza's been under siege. She couldn't freely visit. And if something happens to her mother, she will live with that forever, that she didn't get to see her for 10 years. Do you think it's hard for the world to basically grasp this Palestinian reality? Yes, because we've been dehumanized. Hmm. We are, the, the images, I mean, we spoke about media earlier, the images that get shared are not of what I've just spoke about, a loud, happy family dancing and singing at the beach. They're always violent images. Hmm. They're, they're images that fit a narrative that, that we are alien to the world. So that what happens to us is, is justified and is okay. Our homeland can be taken. Our culture can be erased. You know, our kids don't deserve to live because they were going to grow up to be Hamas anyway. That's the narrative we live in. And it's hurtful because it's so far from the truth. And I spoke about that previously in a speech. We are a warm people. We're generous and kind and fun and loud. And we have the right to live and have follow our dreams. My, my conversation with my brother last night, he said, I just want to live in peace and I want my kids to be safe. And I actually made to him a promise that part of me thinks I'll never be able to keep. I said, I promise you, your kids will grow up in a safe environment where if they want to be a doctor, a teacher, a pilot, I promise you that will happen. I don't know if it will. That's, but I have to give him hope. Yeah. Have you been seeing the political rhetoric coming out of London? I mean, mm. the, the, the government, uh, the UK government, and uh, as well as the Labour Party, the opposition, I'm, you know, their, stan their stance is basically against a ceasefire, and they've been accused of basically enabling Israel over mm -hmm. that stance. How have you been seeing that? Yeah, I definitely think the UK and the US are enabling Israel. Um, I live in Scotland. Uh, you know, I'm biased against the First Minister of Scotland. <laughs> I think he's doing a good job and, you know, he's communicating really well with our communities and, and the need for a ceasefire. Because he, he called for a ceasefire. He did. Hamza I think Yusuf. he was one of the first yeah. people to call for a ceasefire. He spoke about opening a humanitarian corridor. Yeah. Um, I think he was the first to speak about that. And he said, I think, um, Gazan refugees as well. He yeah. basically spoke for the UK to have a resettlement scheme. Yeah, he Gaza would refugees. urge the UK to take refugees and Scotland would be yeah. the first to do so. Yeah. Um, but but that's, mm -hmm. sorry to cut you off, that's completely different than what we've been seeing from the government, mm -hmm. the UK government. Yeah, yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, I'm with the Scottish National Party and I'm happy and proud of that party. And I see you know, members of the Scottish Parliament that are Labour and they're so supportive of the Palestinian plight and they are so focused on humanitarian uh, responses. Um, and I think it must be very difficult for them to then have a leader down in London that's disconnected from the people. We saw, what, a million people march in London? Like, how disconnected is Keir Starmer and Rishi from the reality of what the people that elected them want to see? You, they could take a position of um, a leadership that promotes peace in the Middle East, but instead they've said, oh, one side, I want Israel to win. Literally, Rishi said, I want you to win. But what he didn't say is, what does that win look like? Yeah, it's clearly striking a chord with you. Yeah, what does that win look like? Is it the obliteration of Gaza? Is it 10, 20, 30,000 people killed and then you've won? You know, this idea of destructing, the destruction of Hamas is when we've won, but how do you monitor that because we're not actually hearing of how many Hamas uh, members have been killed. We're just hearing about the huge numbers of civilians being killed. So yeah, Rishi, what does that win look like yeah. to you? Or when is that enough? When have we as a nation suffered enough, died, our children have been killed enough? Yeah. When you see something like, you know, the UK government abstaining from, in a, mm. in a, from a UN resolution calling for a ceasefire, mm. Hmm. How does that strike you? I feel like you're on the wrong side of history. And I think if you're in politics, you're there to make difficult decisions, to abstain, 
talking about humanitarian aid, I, I can't understand that. I can't relate to that. And for me to be associated with the UK in that way, being British, I find difficult. Nadia, I actually wanted to read you a quote that you wrote uh, in a recent op-ed. And it struck me, so I just want to read it out loud to you, and I want to basically get the sense of what you were thinking when mm -hmm. you wrote it. But for a long time, I felt that Palestinian identity has been conflated with the idea that we're barbaric and not relatable. My fear is that our identity could be lost forever, that Palestinians are being eradicated from history, mm -hmm. first under the blockade that has been going on for 17 years, and now the bombardment. I don't know if Gaza st will still exist anymore. The future feels bleak, and I find it hard to think past the immediate safety of people living there now. Mm -hmm. What goes through your head when you hear that? Or when you wrote that? Yeah, that it's just, you know, we're a few weeks in and the situation's getting worse. Yeah. So what I thought was bleak before is just, uh, it's catastrophic now. Um, you know, for a long time, Palestinian culture has not been celebrated because everything has always been around peace and security and safety and always an urgency. So it's like Palestine has been forgotten. We are the forgotten people. When there's not a conflict, time goes on and, and countries move on and they, they've left Palestine. You know, Gaza was under siege for, is it 16 years? 17 or so. Yeah. Just left in that position. That has never been a long-term solution. So, and then we see another conflict and it's on the radar again and then it drops off. And there's something about that because people only ever hear about it in a conflict situation that we don't get to, you don't really get to experience Palestinian, as I said, culture, food, our personalities, um, even just what it looks like day to day and, and the places that we live and the history. Some people think that this conflict started on the 7th of October. You know, that's what we're working with in terms of... The context is The missing. context. So there's a lot of education that is, is needed around the conflict, but also actually, what, does, what is Palestine? You know, where, where is it geographically? And who are the people that lived there? And in what, you know, we have Israel, but we have the West Bank. And how does that actually work? And how did that happen? You know, why are the West Bank and Gaza not connected? And what kind of food do they eat there? And you know, these things don't get explored because we're always in crisis mode. We're always, you know, when we're talking about Palestine, we're talking about saving lives and stopping bombing. And and it's not really people don't get a feel for us as a nation, as a as a people. Do your do your children ask you questions about what's happening? Do you have conversations with mm. them about what's going on? Yes. Yeah, so my fourteen year old just wrote a letter to the head teacher saying that, you know, I feel upset that it's not been on our daily bulletin. Um, really? Yeah. Mm. She said it's not been spoken about at all within the school, that she felt that attention was given to Ukraine, that it's not been given to this situation and it upsets her. So um, she got other friends to write an email as well. Um, my four-year-old, we've just told her it's thunder. Thunder. Because we have the news on all the time. I don't think I've watched a television programme in four weeks. But we just say, oh, she asked, what is that? And we say thunder. And we say that Granny's scared of the thunder. She doesn't like it. And, and she keeps asking when she's coming back. And we say, hopefully she'll be back soon. And so she doesn't truly understand, but she keeps saying, I miss Granny. Um, I mean, you can never be prepped for these kind of conversations, can you? No, and I let my mum speak to the kids. She, you know, we managed to get hold of her. Um, and we hadn't spoken to her in a while. And, and I let the kids quickly say hi. And my 14 year old just burst into tears. So then my mum was crying and saying, please be strong for us, Maya. Um, and then my four-year-old said, Granny, when are you coming back? Can you do my face paint for Halloween? And then my mum just cried some more. So it's, it's, it, it's uh, not a conversation we thought we'd be having when we, we kind of, when they went on their holiday. Um, it's turned into a nightmare. Do you know what's strange? It really strikes me is something that I'm really upset about is that I was doing my budget for this month and I could see in my budget from last month that I'd written Gaza and, a, and an amount. And I'd given my nieces and nephews money. So I gave them small gifts and money because I thought they'll be able to go to a toy shop and buy something. I'm like, why did I do that? There's no toy shops now. There's no place for them to spend that money. 
if I'd sent a toy, they could have something to play with right now. You know, it just, it just shows that we had no idea this was coming. We had no idea that the situation would be like this and that, you know, day to day, we're just wanting to hear that they're alive. Yeah. What do you want to see happen? What do you think needs to happen? I want peace. I want a two state solution that Israel and their citizens live in safety in Palestine they live in peace and they have a future. Right now, you know, my brother said to me, my kids don't have a future. I said to you that promise that I made to him, I want them to have a, a future and I want them to be safe. And for that to happen, we need to stop weaponizing and start talking about peace. There are peace treaties there. You know, world leaders should be looking at how do we not just de-escalate, but how do we get a long-term solution to this problem? Um, you know, this has been since 1948. Palestine is a forgotten nation and a forgotten people, and that needs to be addressed, rather than this started on the 7th of October, and, you know, the way to, to deal with it is actually just to obliterate them and, and turn it to rubble. I don't see how that is a solution, um, but that is what we're seeing right now. So I guess the urgency is a ceasefire. The urgency is letting aid in and be distributed um, and not just a trickle of aid like we're seeing, you know, kind of here's a token number of trucks, but actually meaningful aid. They need, desperately need fuel. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that need to happen that aren't happening and they need to happen, they needed to happen yesterday. Otherwise, there it's the brink of, the, the brink of collapse. Um, UNRWA has said that in a few days, if this continues, they will no longer be able to operate within Gaza. That would be devastating because then you have, how will the aid even be distributed? It's a catastrophe. Yeah. And, and Nadia, I know you're, you're speaking out and you have different media interviews lined up, but what do you hope the world takes away and viewers take away from your story? It's a hard one, let me think. Because I'm tired trying to prove that we're human. I'm, try I'm tired trying to... Do you feel like that's what you're doing? Yeah, and I feel people generally care. We see them marching all across the world. But I'm tired having to show our dead and tell you how horrifying it was and the way that they died and how old they were and how they deserved to live. So what I would say to take away is the world has witnessed many terrible crimes against humanity and we are all witnessing it now. And this is a test for all of us of how we respond. You know, just, you know I think I said it previously, an eye for an eye make the world go blind. And this is a test of every part, of every platform that someone has is how they respond, whether you're a world leader or you're just someone reading the news. Um, I would like everyone to have some faith in humanity again. Nadia, I appreciate you taking time, uh, you know, from a day and from, from a situation that's extremely difficult. Um, you know, I wish you the, the best and I hope you're, you. you're reunited with your family very soon. Thank you very much. That's really kind. Thank you, I really Nadia. appreciate you inviting me on today. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you so much. <laughs>